Amazon FBA has changed massively. If you are launching a product on Amazon in 2019, then these changes could make or break your business. So which ones are gonna be? Amazon is getting harder. It's already changed massively in recent history and it appears to be continuing to change at a rapid rate. Now, there are two different groups of people. The first group of people are the ones who are adapting to these changes, continuing to launch products successfully and profitably. And the second group of people won't be able to adapt to these changes, won't be able to launch products in 2019, will fail, and that will be the end of their Amazon journey. So in this video, you are going to learn what separates those two groups of people, the ones who can and the ones who can't. Um, and you will walk away from this video by the end of it, you will know which group you fall into. And specifically, if you fall into the second group, you're gonna know what to do so that you can move into that first group so you can be one of those people who can successfully do it and you'll be able to confidently say, yes, I'm gonna succeed, I can do this, I can launch products on Amazon. We're also gonna talk about product research strategy, so how you should be looking for products and developing new products successfully and profitably going into 2019. Um, I'm also gonna show you two case studies, two case studies of my own products, one that made $60,000 profit, one that made $20,000 profit, and why the one that made $60,000 isn't necessarily the better product. I'll also run through one thing that you absolutely need to be doing to make sure that you're in that first group of successful sellers who can find and launch products. Um, and I'll show you what that looks like on Amazon and how to do it yourself. Now, as always, my goal with these, uh, with these videos, with this channel is to cut through the noise a little bit to make sure that when you finish watching this video, you can go away, you can take action, your knowledge and understanding of how to build a business, an Amazon business has been improved, okay? So if I can accelerate your Amazon FBA journey, then I'm happy. And if you're happy, then I would like you to subscribe. If you haven't already done so, click the notification bell, smash the thumbs up button. And if you wanna see more of this type of content, then leave me a comment down below telling me that. All of these things will help the channel grow. Um, and I also really love seeing them as well. So I appreciate it. Um, if you're ready now, if you have your learning mode on, maybe you have a pen and paper, if you're ready to take notes, let's dive in and go. Okay, so anytime that anybody is dealing with change, it's always difficult. Um, and this video is gonna be a bit of tough love. So let's start with uh, a concept that you may find helpful in order to deal with this change, right? This is the concept of radical acceptance. I haven't read this book. Um, Tara Brach, she does some cool meditation stuff. I listen to her, her meditations on as a podcast. It's good stuff. But the theory is radical acceptance. So we're dealing with change, but how do we actually deal with it? Because most people really don't deal with changes effectively. Um, this is a three steps process that you can use to deal with change in your life and now specifically with Amazon FBA. So the first step, is to understand the reality. And so that means a lot of people will tell you a lot of different things about what is changing, what's happening with Amazon, what that means going forwards. You need to have a good, basic, solid understanding of, of what reality basically is. Because if you think that you know, you're know you being fed all of this stuff about how it's still really easy, about how you can still just find these hot selling products um, and do all of that, then your understanding of reality is different to the actual reality. And so you can't go any further from there, not successfully anyway. The second stage, once you have that good foundation of what really is happening, what's really been changing and, and how it is continuing to change, then the next stage is to accept that reality. And that doesn't just mean that, yeah, like, you know, these are facts or whatever. It means feel it and just understand that some some things you can't change. They are what they are. And so there's no point dreaming of a past or of a, of a future that will never be or a past that never was. Um, we just need to get the facts, get them down on paper, which I'm gonna talk about in this video, understand what's happening with Amazon FBA. And once you've accepted this reality, this base of facts, basically, um, for what it is, you know that you can't change certain things, then step three, you move forwards, you take action anyway, right? So you do the best that you can do with what you've got, given the situation that you're in. So let's run through those three steps now as it relates to Amazon FBA and everything that's changing into 2019. So first of all, let's get a really clear picture of the reality of Amazon FBA in 2019. So first of all, I've got to say that it's freaking amazing because as you can see here, there are 40% of sellers are making over $100,000 a year and 55% of sellers are making six, seven, eight, nine figures. And then look at this pretty graph and you can see these big numbers and I'm gonna stop right here. Let me just, no, oh, actually that's the wrong color. I want this to be red. No, forget, forget that, okay? It's not totally amazing in 2019. And there's a very big problem with these numbers. Now, I got this from a course sales page, um, somebody selling an online Amazon course. Um, and you'll see these, these numbers and this particular graph everywhere. And it is a really inaccurate representation of the reality of Amazon FBA in 2019. The numbers are correct. The sales figures are correct. So there are two reasons why you shouldn't look at this 
And, and if you do, you shouldn't take anything out of it. So first of all, um, it's revenue, not profit, right? But that's not really the main reason. Generally, most of these businesses, I can tell you that if you're running you know, a million dollar business on Amazon, you're probably making a decent profit margin. Um, otherwise, you stop, you, you go out of business. It's really easy to just sell off your inventory and then quit and give up. And, and if you're not making any money, that's what you do. So that's okay, it's not, it's not profit margins, which is what a lot of people say, you know, revenue, but what about profit? Here's the real reason. The question isn't the numbers. It's not, you know, is somebody making $100,000 a year in revenue selling on Amazon? The question is who is selling $100,000 a year on Amazon? Who is the specific seller? And particularly, like, what are their resources? What do they have available to them? Because there is a huge difference between a 16 year old kid who is living in his parents' basement and he has, he started with $500 and that kid is making $100,000 on Amazon. That's freaking amazing. If that was the case, then I would say, yes, it is totally amazing. And I apologize for scribbling all over this, but I had to make a point. However, so that's that's one case, is this teenage kid making $100,000 a year on Amazon. What if instead of a kid, a solo kid with no money, it's actually a, you know, a, per, a business with five employees and between them, they're only turning over $100,000. We don't know which is the case from these numbers. And, and that's the most important thing. I can tell you the, the, the who, the, the people that are actually making up the sellers on Amazon, that demographic is changing. Now that is really, really critically important. So forget about this. If you see this particular graph or particularly if you see, you should definitely sell on Amazon purely because people are selling on Amazon. I am and more and more seeing that that is actually very misleading, all right? So forget this. Let's talk about the real reality of Amazon FBA in 2019. It's simply getting more and more competitive. But what does that really mean? When, when I say something is more competitive, what does that mean to you as somebody who actually wants to sell on Amazon? So I'm gonna tell you now, the, the likelihood or your ability to succeed and the magnitude of that potential success is going to be defined by specific things. It's, it's not rolling a dice, it's not chance. There are things which determine whether you will succeed or will, whether you will fail and, and how badly or how well you do either of those, right? So the five factors, as I see them, are firstly, your available capital. That's how much money you have to spend. Um, I'd say in 2019, as a minimum, $3,000, right? I'm not gonna go into the details of that, but I'd say if you have less than that, you simply don't have this resource available to compete with the rest of the competition. So first, and most importantly, is your available capital, because at least in the private label business model, there's no way around it. You don't have money, you can't buy goods, you can't, you can't sell goods. Number two, your ability to learn and to be creative. So you don't need to be super smart to do this, but you need to be able to take information in and then figure something out or like solve problems and get better. And creative thinking as well, which means to not just have to ask other people everything about anything that you wanna learn. You have to be able to take this information in and then just like solve problems in your head and also come up with solutions that are creative that not many other people are thinking of, right? And that's how you stand out from competition. Now, keeping in mind that if your competition is also really good at learning and really good at being creative and thinking outside of the box, then it's harder for you and you need to step that up. So that's the second resource that you need to have is the ability to learn and to be creative and to be a creative thinker. Um, the third resource is your ability to consistently put in effort and to do work, basically. That's like just hours, that's grind, that's grit, um, hustle, whatever you wanna call it. If you don't have that ability, then yeah, you can have $20,000 available capital. Um, you can be the smartest person in the world, but if you're not ready to, to work, to put hours in consistently, you know, five, I'd say probably 10 to 15 hours a week would be good for a period of six months. If you can't commit that or you don't want to commit that, then your competition who may have less ability to learn, they may be less creative, they may have less money, they will outwork you, right? So that's how your competition will, um, will beat you there. So that's also really important. Number four is available time. So again, it doesn't matter if you have all of these things if you only have one hour available per week or month, you're just not gonna get anywhere. Um, and uh, by the way, these are, I've ordered these in terms of importance. And, and you'll notice that available capital is number one. But anyway, getting back to the last one, which is your existing experience. Now, I've had a lot of people come to me who already have experiences uh, running bricks and mortar businesses or service businesses or some sort of online business, or definitely if they already have on Amazon experience. All of those things are great if you have them, and if you don't have them and your competition has them and they already know how business works because there is this whole like sea of things that you need to learn to be able to actually like sustain a business for more than a period of a few months. Um, again, it's, it's just a balancing act. It's like, well, do you have it or do the people you're competing against have it? If they have it, you don't, then you're at a disadvantage. 
So these five factors will define your success. Um, and you can think about this and take it to extremes. Like for example, if you have $100,000 to throw at one product, you will win because you will be able to outspend everybody else, right? And similarly, if you can put in 10 times as many hours as anybody else and you can just learn and get better, you will exponentially start to outpace your competition with enough time. Um, now consider those five resources for yourself, what you have, what you don't have. And then just keep in mind that when I say it's getting more competitive, what this really means is that, I mean, firstly, there are a greater number of sellers. So there are more people coming in, but probably more importantly, because that doesn't really tell you that much. Yeah, great, there's more people. But more importantly, it means there are more sellers with more of these five resources. So there are more sellers with more available capital to, to, to put into new products. Um, there are more sellers who can learn fast and, and think creatively, or they have experience with Amazon or running businesses previously, um, or there are more sellers who are ready to work, basically. They're ready to put their hours in and to keep grinding until they see success. So in 2019, you are competing against a greater number of those sellers. And I'm gonna separate these two groups into um, more sellers, which is the crowd, right? That's just you know your average uh, new private label seller. So they maybe don't have many of these resources. And then there's the second group, which is I'm gonna call the big dogs. These guys are like they're established businesses. There's a lot of competition coming out of China. Um, it's just people with business experience, people with more money, whatever it is. These two groups um, are important. So I'm gonna come back to these later. But for now, recognize that when I say it's more competitive or when somebody says Amazon is more competitive, this is what it means. You are in competition against other people. When, when people say that no one's competing against anyone, that's not true. You are directly competing against the other people selling similar products as you. Um, and so what it's gonna come down to is some combination of these five factors and how well you fit into that will define your success on Amazon in 2019. So that's point A. Point B, I'm gonna zoom this in. I, I hope my uh, camera isn't cutting this off. Point B of uh, understanding the reality of Amazon in 2019 is you are now coming late to the party, right? So what that means is 2019, it's harder than it was in the previous years. In 2015, in 2016, 17, 18, up until today, each year consecutively, it has gotten harder and harder. And now at this point, I'm gonna go out on a limb and I'm gonna say that I'm not, and you are definitely not, you're no longer an early adopter. So there's this thing called the uh, technology or the adoption curve. And this basically defines the percentage of any sort of population or the uptake of any new thing, basically. So for example, you know, the, the first 2.5% of people who started selling on Amazon, they were the innovators. Um, and actually, as a funny fact, the innovators don't necessarily capture all of the value. They don't get to make all of the money. It's actually the early adopters normally who really benefit um, because at this stage, everything is like getting a bit more mature, but not many people are in on it yet, right? So you wanna be an early adopter when you get into a new business model, um, something like Amazon, Shopify, whatever else. If you're in that group, that first like 13%, you're gonna kill it. It's gonna be really easy money. Um, and th those are all the like wild success stories that you see from years ago. We're no longer there. So I'm gonna go out on a limb and I'm gonna say that we are now in probably the middle of this early majority stage. And what that means is, again, going back up to this point, it's more competitive because there are more people coming in. People are seeing more and more with you know, YouTube, for example, um, the information's out there. So anyone who sees this as an opportunity, <laughs> they're not alone. There's, there's now crowds and crowds of people who recognize that Amazon FBA, um, it's a money-making opportunity. So you're no longer in that first percentage of people, which means the opportunity to make all the easy money, that's now gone. Okay, so that is understanding the reality of Amazon FBA in 2019 uh, from my honest perspective. So let's move on to step two and let's learn how to accept that reality. So having said all of that, all of that negativity out of the way, I what I have to tell you is that it's still easier now and it's easier in 2019 than it's going to be in 2020, 2021, 2022, and so on and so forth. Um, when I handed in my resignation letter, when I was quitting my career, I left everyone with a beautiful quote, which I will always come back to. And it goes, uh, the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. And the second best time to plant that tree is today. And <laughs> it holds true in this case as well with Amazon. But the truth is that the threshold, that the barrier to reaching that opportunity, to reaching that financial freedom, that barrier and that threshold is getting higher as time goes on, right? So just going back to these five resources here, these are very important and I want you to write these down um, and to think about them. So it's capital, how well can you learn and, and, and think outside the box? How much effort can you put in? How much time do you actually have available? 
and what's your experience, whether it's on Amazon or selling online or with any other business or anything basically where you're, you're working for yourself um, to make money. So keeping those five things in mind because they're critically important, then I want you to ask these three questions to yourself. So first of all, wherever you are now, which of those five, and it may be one, it may be all five, which of those has stopped you from succeeding up until now, up until today? Answer that. Secondly, which of these five do you need to improve on? Which do you need to build up more, right? Because these are resources they, that you can build them over time. Um, and then thirdly, which of the five is your strongest resource? You really need to have a really clear understanding of where you fit into all of this rather than just going blindly into this. So ask yourself those three questions, uh, write your answers down. And by the way, the idea for this video today came from a mastermind call that I did with my two other FBA sellers. Um, we're buddies and in total per month, we do around about $350,000 in revenue and this process is the same process that we're going through as as relatively high level sellers okay so we're doing this we're understanding what are the facts what's the real reality we're not trying to you know cover our eyes to it we're understanding the reality we're accepting it and then we're doing this we're asking like what do we need to do differently what do we need to do better what do we have available at our disposal and what do we need to work on and that brings us to the next stage then so step three we're moving forwards and we're taking action now first of all what does that mean it means you need to build those resources over time those five things whether it's your capital whether it's your time whether it's your um, ability to work or your experience those things aren't fixed right so if you're behind everyone if you're ahead of everyone then that's fantastic then keep going keep doing what you're doing but if you're behind and you identify that you are deficient in some of those areas then you need to build those resources up the only one that's fixed is is time and that's not even really fixed because most of us can take time out of other areas in our lives and put it into things like getting getting better at a business, you know, building a business. Um, I'm going to use an example. I may be showing my age. I may be showing my my uh, nerdy background. But anyone who plays real time strategy video games, think about it like a RTS video game. You start with a base with like a villager or something, and then you have very few starting resources. And you got to build those resources up before you can go out and start, you know, attacking other bases and competing with other people. Because if you just go out with your first little peon. Um, and you can't compete, you will lose. So let's get into the practical aspects now. Let's talk a bit about product selection strategy and, and what we need to be doing uh, potentially very differently to what we were doing before. I'm gonna say it really simply, the one thing that you wanna take away from this video is stop going for the products that attract, remember from before, there are, is the crowd and the big dogs. We wanna stop going for the products that are attracting the crowd and attracting the big dogs. Uh, caveat is unless you are a big dog yourself. So. Remember the crowd is just any sellers, the, the vast number of new sellers that are coming in and the big dogs are sellers with those five, five resources um, more than what you have basically. So what products are attracting A, the crowd and B, big dogs and how then do we avoid them? So first of all, the crowd is going for, and the crowd is people who are following like YouTube gurus for example. The crowd is going for fad products. They're going for hot products. They're going for anything that looks like it really has really high revenue, really low reviews. Um, they're not really trying to differentiate because they don't know how. They're uh, just basically taking somebody's advice that you can get into this easily and going for that really low hanging fruit, the easiest possible wins. Um, you can also call these me too products where there's just 50 different people selling the same thing. Another example would be if you see somebody giving you a list of products to sell, like top 50 hottest products or something like that, best products to sell on Amazon in 2019, those are the products that the crowd's going for. And those are the products that you want to stop going for <laughs> immediately. Okay, so I hope that makes sense. And the next group, the big dogs, the big dogs, which is again, they're experienced sellers. These are big businesses. These are a lot of Chinese competitors um, or experienced Amazon sellers in general. The big dogs in general are gonna be looking for higher revenue products. But the big dogs, they're not as concerned about review count because they have going all the way back to those resources, I won't scroll back up. They're gonna have a lot more capital, they're gonna have a lot more experience and know-how um, and creative thinking as well. So the review count doesn't matter as much to them. So they want high revenue, but not necessarily such low review counts. The big dogs, they're also gonna be able to spend more on differentiation because they've done it before. They know that it works and so they're willing, and again, they have the money behind it to spend big on differentiation to, to bring out improved products. And they're gonna do it better than you probably too, because again, it's just a matter of doing it over and over again and knowing what works. And then finally, they're expanding out their existing products. So anything that's already existing brands, they're doing that. And they're also using off Amazon traffic going into those listings, right? So they have a lot of things going for them and they're picking products that allow them to do all of these things. So that leads me to our 2019 product strategy. And it's simple, it's two things. Number one, avoid home runs. And I'm gonna very simply define a home run as anything that's selling greater than $20,000 per month. 
anything. I'm just going to say that with almost no exceptions, except for the asterisk, which is if you consider yourself to be a big dog, and remember the definition, big dog means that you have those five resources. You think you've got them in, in you know high demand in all of them. Then you can go for those products. Otherwise, you're competing with the big dogs. So avoid those products. You're also competing with the crowds as well, by the way. Avoid them and go for singles. So I'm gonna very roughly say that a single is something where you can expect to make between three and probably around $10,000 being the upper limit. Um, sometimes more than that, but it depends again where you fit into those five resources, um, whether you're ahead of, you're better than average or below average. So that is the first pillar of the 2019 product strategy is to avoid the crowds and the big dogs that are going for their high revenue products and just go for lower revenue products. It's the, it's the single most simple metric that everybody looks at and everybody wants that to be really high. And the second pillar is differentiation and improving your product. This is pretty much a necessity. I would consider it mandatory when, when choosing products going into 2019. If you're selling or planning to sell the same product that there are five, 10, 20, 50, or 100 other sellers selling either exactly the same or very similar to it, then stop and just ask yourself, why would a customer actually buy your product over everybody else's? If you don't have a good answer, then the default answer is going to come down to price. And when it comes down to price, you've lost. This strategy, that strategy has just failed. Um, so these two points will, will define a successful product strategy in 2019. I'm gonna show you now a case study or two case studies of my own products, one that was a home run and one that was a single. And I'm gonna talk about which one was better. So let me bring these up. Okay, so top left, this was a single. This was a single. Um, I picked it because there was only one other seller. Um, they had a really poor listing. My product had better packaging. It was basically the only real differentiation. Um, but I had also the scope to make a much better listing. So that was a, a single. Uh, they were selling, I think it was under $10,000 a month. It was in the five to $10,000 a mark range. Now, the key takeaways here are the trends. So I've put this in, in the red line is sales over time. And I think, I don't know whether you can see the date, but this is going from January of this year up until September of this year. And the purple line, one of the purple lines showing profit, blue line is showing units sold, right? And so over this nine month period, this product made uh, $20,000, $23,000. And it was starting at $2,000 a month profit. But here's the kicker is that nine months later, that profit has gone up by 50%. It went up a huge amount from $2,000 a month, which is also not bad by the way, to now at $3,000 a month profit. And so it started as a single, it actually started last year um, selling a lot less than that. And it's just consistently gone up. Um, so that's $23,000 in nine months. And actually it's a seasonal product. So over Christmas, I don't know, over 12 months, it'll probably be $40,000 or something in profit. And this was a single this was a product that did not look very attractive um when i first went into it went into that niche on the other hand this is my probably perfect case study of a home run and why it's generally a bad idea um so this product was my big home run product um and as you can see it's the same sort of thing it's a green line sales uh purple line is profit and again, the key point here is that it's gone down a lot and the numbers were a lot higher. So this was in September of 2017, it was making $6,000 a month in profit. And then you can see in Christmas how much it made a lot. And then what happened was actually a whole bunch of competitors jumped on. I can't remember when it was towards this end of the year and then it didn't really have too much of an impact for December. But then coming into this year, 2018, uh, it, it tanked, it tanked the profit. So the, the volume stayed, but the profitability, which is from the price went down a lot. And so that's what happens when you have 20 other competitors selling your same product or, or a similar product, um, you it ends up being a price war. And so you'll see that your price will go down and your profit margin will go down. And then it doesn't matter how many you're selling at the end of the day, you just can't make that much money. So this product uh, in, over this period, it made $60,000 and probably over the total life of the product, it was around about $100,000. But now it's making, I'm gonna zoom this in, 80% less than it was 12 months ago. And having analyzed this and analyzed this relative to all of my other products, nearly 40 at the moment, the reason is that it stuck its head out. It became a home run, more than $20,000 a month it was selling in terms of revenue, and it didn't have 
really powerful differentiation. And so what that meant was that other people could see that it was a popular product, um, both the crowds and the big dogs could see that there was a lot of money to be made. And so a bunch of other sellers came on. And then as you can see over this period of time, um, the profit has just gone down and down and down. But hold on, I know you're thinking, well, this one still made more money, so therefore it's better than that one. But the, the point is to think higher level than this and to accept that the risk on this product, on this um, $60,000 a month one, oh, sorry, $60,000 total profit one, the risk is a lot higher. I'm, I'm lucky that I'm still making money on this one. It could easily have just gone into negative territory and I could have had to completely drop this product and, and just consider it a failure. Yes, I still made a lot of money, but we want to build a sustainable business, not just this quick flash of you know money that we make and then suddenly we don't make it anymore. We really want to be going, you and I both want to be going for products like this that are increasing over time. And if you follow this strategy, you differentiate well, you improve your product, you avoid those big home runs that really stick out that attract the crowds and the big dogs, um, then you will end up with products like this that will start making you one to $2,000 a month and they will end up making you $3,000 a month or even more. And that's a great product and you want that for perpetuity or at least for years to come. So that's the product strategy. The next question is, well, how do I actually do that? How do I differentiate? How do I improve? So I'm gonna show you that now. And talking about differentiation, what I actually mean is improvement. <laughs> um, what I don't mean is just making something different for the sake of being different, right? So don't be the person who just puts the flap in the pants to make the pants into picnic pants. So to avoid your own picnic pants situation and turn just a differentiation for the sake of being different into an improvement for the sake of improving your customers' lives and therefore creating a successful product, here are some questions that you should be asking um, when you're thinking about a product or a niche to get into and how you can make an improvement. The first question is, why would somebody buy your product instead of the competition? And, and like we talked about before, your answer can't just be price. It needs to be something tangible, something real, um, a real answer. And you need to think about this and it really depends. Each product will have a different answer. Um, for example, if it's something clothing related or, or a, you know, a bath towel or something for babies, a lot of the time maybe it's, it's that the material is nicer and it feels nicer on the skin. Um, it may be a design related thing. So it could be a cup with a nice handle. So it's actually really nice to hold versus the existing products which aren't that comfortable or maybe the handle is too small. You have almost endless opportunities for answering these questions. And if that doesn't trigger that first question, then ask these two questions. Firstly, how does your improvement make the customer's life easier? So again, if it's an ergonomics thing, it, it just makes it easier to hold or easier to use. If it's a, um, maybe it's a cool design as well. And it actually, uh, makes your customer look better or feel better. Um, it could be a, if you're selling something with ingredients, something that's maybe topical or a beauty, you know, facial scrub or something like that, um, then it's for the health benefits. And thirdly, ask what pain does it solve? So that could be, it could be a physical pain, like improving the ergonomics of something so it's more comfortable to use. It could be a, or a psychological pain, for example, um, like the fear of doing something or maybe the fear of being overweight when you're selling uh, exercise equipment. Now, while you're in the process of asking yourself those questions, you also need to be able to find how to identify these improvements and how to work out which improvements are actually in demand by the most amount of people. Because the goal is to not change the world with this differentiation, um, not to put every possible feature onto your product. It's just to change it and make it better in one probably simple but effective way. One way that actually does really ease pain, make somebody's life better, um, again, in a simpler way as possible. So here are six ways to do that. So first way is customer reviews. Now this is the most powerful on Amazon. It's the only sort of data source that we have across the internet where we have hundreds and hundreds of thousands or even millions of customers who are telling you their honest feedback about what they do and don't like about products already. And all you have to do is go into the niche, start looking through these products and start looking at the reviews. Uh, so I'm gonna hop into this right now. I'm gonna show you how to identify improvements, how to work out which ones are important, uh, and then to take that away and, and recognize how you can make your product stand out above all of this competition. So let's hop in now. Okay, so we're looking at this origami kit and I wanna know how I can, if I wanted to get into this market, how I could improve this product, make it better, stand out from this seller and stand out from the rest as well. So I'm gonna show you one example, but if I was doing this for myself, my own business, I would be looking at probably every single listing in this niche. I'm just gonna do it for this one and I'm gonna to go to the reviews and if I was doing this, I would read every single review, but I'm gonna start right now with the one star, two star and three star reviews. And now all I'm looking for is what are people unhappy about? If it's something that I can fix, then I'm gonna fix it. I'm gonna remove that pain from these customers' lives. So I'm also gonna go and make this a little bit easier to track. Uh, I'm gonna go dislike or reason and then count. 
So what I'm going to do is I'm going to count each reason and see which ones are occurring the most frequently, right? So I'm going to start from top to bottom and then go through the one star, two star, one star, two star, and three star reviews. So the first one is instructions, or let's call them bad instructions. Add a count of one. Second one, wouldn't recommend this product. She and I were equally frustrated. Poor directions, poor graphic directions, very few words. Okay, so that's two. And by the way, as well, while I'm doing this, I want to take the, the actual language out of this uh, so that I know really vividly what the pain is and how I'm going to fix it. But again, in this case, I'm just doing this quickly. So I'm just writing this down um, briefly. So that's a one star reviews and they were both the same, which is good. So let's go through the two star reviews. Not for kids. As an adult, I find it very difficult to follow the instructions. So that is three. Two stars, instructions. Count four. Last one. Not that easy to work with for young children. That's not actually giving me anything, so I'm gonna leave that out. Uh, it could be instructions as well, but let's check out the three star now. The guide, instructions. Box came damaged, so we can't really do that much about that. Probably, it's probably on Amazon's end. Um, packaging. Oops. Depending on the, on, the, on the actual problem, it could be packaging uh, that you can improve or it could just be something that's a delivery problem. So in this case, paper is pretty. Directions, six. Right, so I'm not gonna go through the rest of the reviews, but this is exactly how I do it. And this is a really great example. What you want to see are a few reasons and then one that really stands out as being the most frequent problem because that's, you know then, and if you check this for multiple listings, you'll see the same sort of thing. Um, that's what you can improve. Now, what would be not as good was if it was like, you know, poor quality colors, pardon the spelling, one, and that was like one, and I don't know how else can you can go wrong, um, smelled bad, one. If you're seeing something like this when you're doing this for a product and there's like a whole bunch of reasons and they're all spread out, so customers are all unhappy about different things, that's not necessarily a good opportunity for improvement because you don't know which ones are actually in demand. And if you fix one thing, then you know it might not help you basically. But in this case, it was I think six and one and then get rid of these. So looking at this, if I did this for say three listings, get the same results, I need to improve the instructions, right? So this is gonna be my improvement and just going back to the listing. So first of all, I'm gonna make that improvement. I could, in this case, um, definitely improve the actual paper instructions. I could also uh, provide a video guide and have a link and an insert card, I could do that in this product. What else could I do? I could also um, email it to them through the email sequence. And all these things, if you can improve that pain point, you will get a whole bunch more reviews. You'll be able to um, sell it for a higher price and, and it is a better product and it's solving that problem and removing that pain. I wouldn't stop there. I would also, because the thing is, customers read reviews, right? So customers are gonna know that this product has terrible instructions. So I'm gonna go on my product, if I were to launch this, and I would put it in here somewhere, maybe as one of these top three bullet points, I would say like the best instructions on the market. There's no way that you can possibly misinterpret these instructions. A two-year-old could follow them or something like that. And I'd probably include it in one of these listing images. So that is a really quick case study as to how, uh, where are we? As to how we can identify improvements and then implement them and advertise them effectively as well through customer reviews. Second way um, is good for bundling and that is to look at frequently bought together or customers also bought. So I'm gonna hop back into Amazon and just show you this. So if we look down here, actually there's no frequently also frequently bought together. Normally you'll see frequently bought together, it'll be three items. And what that indicates is that when somebody is adding this to cart, the next two items are the most common items also added together. So they're not necessarily by the same seller. They're not necessarily, um, you know, the same type of product but people are buying them together. And that's what you wanna know if you're creating a bundle, you wanna know what actually goes well together. And the most simple way of doing this is simply pick those three products and then put them as one product. Uh, and that's a bundle and that's an improvement. And normally you'll find that you can do it for a uh, much lower cost, especially if you can put things inside each other. Um, let's see, surely there's an example here. So normally most listings will have that. Uh, in this case, they don't, but you could also check customers who bought this item also bought. So that's similar to frequently also bought together, um, but it'll give you a longer list of products. And so when you're looking at this, you can actually, rather than just seeing two other items, you can see a whole bunch and you can pick out, you know, what are the most common themes. So as an example, let's just say that 
this product was most frequently bought with um, a, a carrying case for origami, okay? So, and that would actually be a perfect example of improvement because the carrying case, you could actually put it inside this box and then put the origami inside the carrying case, inside that box, so the size won't change. And so you'll be paying exactly the same FDA fees. However, let's say that the, going back and asking those questions, um, a customer who wants them both together would pay like five to $10 more for the carry box. Um, you're gonna get charged 20 cents for that box. And so you just made $9.80 in additional profit uh, without doing anything. So that's a really easy and sometimes really effective improvement. So that's that one. Uh, where were we? Third one, ask your supplier. So this is more applicable if you already have a existing product and you have a relationship with your supplier, but you can always ask new suppliers directly through Alibaba as well. Your suppliers, if they're factories, they are the product experts, they're manufacturing the actual products. So they know exactly what can be changed, what can be improved, um, and what can be done differently from the manufacturing end. So just ask them, it doesn't cost anything. Um, sometimes they'll suggest really bad ideas. Sometimes they'll actually suggest a really good idea and you go away and you check it on Amazon and you see that, yeah, actually, there is demand for this. There are reviews saying that I wish it had this and they can make this. Um, and it, you get the same benefits, just like pay a little bit more and then you'll be able to add a lot of value and therefore charge a lot more. So ask your supplier, sometimes it really pays off. Fourth way to identify improvements, use the product yourself or solve a problem in your own life. So I'm not saying that you should go out and just look in your life and just find something and then solve that. But if there's something that jumps out to you as a pain that you have in your life and you know that there's a solution to it and you know that you can make that improvement, then do that. That's a great way to identify an improvement, get a product to market. Um, so using it yourself is definitely a good way of doing it. And number five, take features from a different product and not just a different product, it could be a completely different niche um, and then apply it to a different niche. So for example, let's say we're looking at some sort of baby product. Let's say we're looking at a, um, a baby hooded towel or something. And there's a really popular design for that towel. And then you're actually looking at some other baby product. I don't know what it would be, what do babies buy? Um, some sort of baby clothing. You can take that popular design from the hooded towel and it may not exist in the other baby clothing product that you're looking at selling, but you can easily transfer that across. And those are actually some of my most successful improvements is where I've just taken an idea that I saw from a different product and then translated it into my own products. Um, so that one really works very well. And the last one is to ask other real users of the product. So again, you could do this yourself in your own life, or you can simply ask people around you. But if you do this, make sure that they're not just people like your mom or your girlfriend or your boyfriend or somebody who's just gonna be like, yes, that's a great idea, go do it. Because you need to get an unbiased perspective. So that is the sixth and final way to identify improvements uh, by asking real users. This concludes the product launch strategy that will be working in 2019. Remember, avoid the crowds, avoid the big dogs by avoiding home runs, go for singles, three to $10,000 a month, differentiate your product, improve it. Here are the tools I've given you, the keys to the castle again in this video. Uh, if you've enjoyed all of this, if you got value out of it, then do smash the like button, subscribe and click the notification bell if you haven't already and I will see you in the next video. And by the way, one last thing, I'm not sure whether it'll be too late by the time I upload this, but if you're interested in learning a lot more in a structured way from me, then check out my course link down below. It may or may not be open, but check it out if you're interested. Peace.